Let's get going. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is John Schaefer. I'm town supervisor. This is Fran Majeski, deputy supervisor. Patty Fitzgerald, town board member. David Marnicki, uh, town board member. I want to I thank you all for coming, and we've got a great presenter here, and I'm going to ask you to hold your comments if you did not. This is a work session. If, if you want to keep going on about it, I'll ask you to leave, and I'll stop the meeting and we'll hold David up. He's got to squeeze a whole lot of stuff in a little time, so as, as quiet as we can be, and when his presentation's over, if you'd like to leave, you're welcome to leave. If you, if you want to stay, stay. That's, that's, whatever, that's your option. But just remember, no comments, direct nothing up here, I will not answer you, and I will ask you to leave on the second time. So, you know, let's be fair to him. Uh, David Slotch is Executive Director of Senior uh, and Senior Attorney at Community Environmental Defense Council Incorporated, a nonprofit public uh, interest law firm based in Ithaca, New York. Uh, CEDS, or CEDC, is a 501c3 organization. Mr. Slotch is admitted to practice law in Texas, Massachusetts, and New York. He grew up in Vesta, New York, and is a graduate from Vesta High School. He practiced with, with large law firms in Dallas and Boston before moving back to New York. Thank you for moving back to New York. Uh, <laughs> he's going to talk about the availability of the local laws to protect health, safety, and community assets in the face of industrial uh, scale gas drilling. Please uh, welcome Dave. organization. We are a nonprofit public interest uh, pro bono law firm. Pro bono means that we work for free. Um, our, we formed our organization in 2009. Um, in all of 2009, and all of 2010, and all of 2011, well, let me just answer the question. Our source of funding is a combination of uh, contributions from individuals, folks like you, donations are tax deductible, um, grants and the majority of our uh, funding uh, for 2009, 2010, 2011 uh, basically came uh, out of my pocket and my wife's pocket. The super majority of our funding uh, comes and came from our retirement accounts. We have not so far in 2009, 2010, or 2011 um, uh, taken a salary from this. There was, there's no money to take it, which is coming from our retirement account. So um, there is third-party funding. Um, it's m the, uh, the majority of all the funding, it comes from our retirement accounts. The majority of what's left that doesn't come from our retirement accounts comes from individual donors. And then there is a minority slice of that um, that comes from foundations as grants. <clears throat> OK. Um, before I start, I want to thank the board for allowing me to present here. Um, this is very special to me. Um, I grew up in Vestal. I was born in Ideal Hospital. Um, I went to elementary school on Clayton Avenue. I walked across the street to the old junior high, walked back across the street to the high school. Um, my father uh, and stepmom live here now on Glenwood Road. In fact, my father has been here his entire life, uh, 70 some years. So I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to speak today. Um, what I want to talk about is the availability of local land use laws uh, to protect health, safety, and community assets from uh, uh, basically high impact uses, specifically uh, industrial scale gas drilling. The, um, all right. Uh, I want to apologize up front for using PowerPoint. I don't like PowerPoint. I've been with PowerPoint for 30 some years and I don't use it when I can avoid it. The reason I'm using PowerPoint in this presentation um, is that there is a phenomenally large amount of misinformation out there about what the law is and what it isn't. Most of it comes from non-lawyers. A small part comes from lawyers. Um, some of it, I, I assume most of it is, is uh, innocent. Some of it's intentional. But what I want to do and what, why I like the PowerPoint is I can actually put the law and show you what the law says and what the judges have said. 
So you can judge for yourself what's, what's what. Normally, I go through the availability, um, your, your general zoning authority and police power authority um, to pass land use laws. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight <clears throat> uh, about what you have in a vacuum. I'm going to go right to not being in the vacuum. I want to talk about a state law that some people will tell you takes away your right to pass land use laws. Um, so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the types of legal challenges that could be brought should you decide to pass uh, a protective law like this. Uh, I want to talk about some challenges that have been brought, and then I want to talk about uh, the risks of waiting to act. Um, the fracking proponents will tell you couldn't, you can't, or shouldn't use these land use laws um, because they tell you that it's wrong to tell people what to do with their property. It's un-American or that the state has taken away your authorities to pass these protective laws, uh, or that passing such a law will be a taking of private property. If that doesn't sort of get you, uh, then they'll say, all right, well, at least wait till the DEC has finished with the yes guys. I'm going to go through each of those and tell you why uh, those are mistaken positions. Um, <clears throat> in a vacuum, you've got the right to pass these kind of laws. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, one other thing to keep in mind when you're talking to lawyers about New York law, we all know that the United States Supreme Court is the highest court in the land and that that carries the day. In New York State, the Supreme Court is not the highest court. It's the lowest court. It's a trial court. And the highest court is the Court of Appeals. So not just gas drilling, but anything. Uh, when you're talking to a lawyer about New York law, you might want your ears to prick up when the lawyer says Court of Appeals because that is the highest court in the state and that's tantamount or equivalent at the state level to the U.S. Supreme Court. So there's no question in a vacuum that you've got the right to pass these kind of laws, zoning laws and the like. We're not dealing with a vacuum. Um, some people will tell you that the gas mining statute preempts or takes away your right to pass these laws. The gas mining statute is ECL 230303 subsection 2. And what that says specifically, it's important to know exactly what it says because people come in and tell you that your, your, your authority has been taken away or preempted. <clears throat> what this law says, the state law says, is that municipalities, local, uh, whether it's a city, a town, or a village, um, do not have the right to pass local laws or ordinances relating to the regulation, that's the magic phrase, relating to the regulation of the oil, gas, and solution mining industries. You know what oil and gas is, solution mining is salt mining. So the question is, what does relating to the regulation uh, of the oil and gas industry mean? The Court of Appeals has not looked at this issue either way in the context of this particular statute. They have looked at language virtually identical to this in the context of the mineral mining statute. Gas mining and mineral mining are treated under two different statutory schemes in New York State. But the language uh, at the time of the cases I'm going to talk to you about was virtually identical to this language that I'm talking to you about. So we, got to see, we have to see what relating to regulation really means, according to the court. The Court of Appeals, remember, that's the highest court in the state. The Court of Appeals has said unequivocally and repeatedly, and I might add unanimously, <clears throat> albeit in a slightly different context, that the legal effect of language virtually identical to that gas mining statute I just showed you is that while a town may not regulate the operations and processes of whatever industry it is that is subject to this law, the town may in fact prohibit that industry altogether using land use laws of general applicability. Operations and processes are things such as how deep uh, they can drill, um, which formations, uh, Marcellus versus Utica, setbacks, bonding requirements. Uh, some lawyers will even tell you things such as hours of operation. Can they work 24-7, uh, lighting, things like that. <clears throat> those are operations and processes. You may not touch those. But according to the court, unequivocally, repeatedly, and unanimously, in a slightly different context, which I'll talk about, uh, you may, in fact, prohibit those uses outright. <clears throat> Court of Appeals, highest court in the state, unanimous decision, reading language that is virtually identical to what I just showed you. <clears throat> we cannot, this is the Court of Appeals, the highest court in the state, we cannot interpret the phrase local laws relating to, in this case, the mineral mining industry, as including a town zoning ordinance. Okay? 
applying all traditional rules regarding statutory interpretation, there's no reason why the language in the gastrolin statute, when it gets to the Court of Appeals, which it will, there are two lawsuits pending now, which I'll explain to you, should be interpreted any differently than the language in the mineral mining statute. And again, in the mineral mining statute, construing language virtually identical to this, they have said unequivocally uh, that the, uh, the localities may, in fact, prohibit these uses outright. They may not uh, permissibly op uh, regulate the operations or processes. So, is this a mainstream legal position? As Sarah Palin would say, you betcha. <laughs> <coughs> Over the last year, this position has become very mainstream. I'm going to pick up my pace. I apologize to everybody, especially the people up here, but I don't want to run out of time. In New York State, the biggest law firms, the 500 uh, lawyer firms, 1,000 lawyer firms are all based downstate in Manhattan. In upstate, the largest firm we have, or one of the largest firms, <coughs> uh, is Bond, Schenick and King. They're based in Syracuse. They are one of the oldest, most conservative law firms in the state. Um, they, if there's an issue between industry and the environment, they invariably represent industry. If there's an, indus if there's a, an issue between labor and management, they invariably represent management. You cannot get more conservative than Bond, Schenick, and King. Bond, Schenick, and King agrees. <clears throat> uh, oh, one other thing. When a lawyer gives an opinion, that, at least to a lawyer, is a much bigger deal than when a non-lawyer gives an opinion. Because when a lawyer gives an opinion, you can sue the lawyer on that. Okay? <clears throat> so, Bond, Schenick, and King is of the same legal opinion that I just told you. They see no, they say it in a fancier way, <clears throat> but the author sees no sound basis for believing that the gastroline preemption language will be construed any differently than the mineral mining statute. Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah I want to talk about briefly. They're not as large as Von Schenick and King. They're a large firm based in Albany. For many, the reason they're on the slide in this presentation, for many towns, <clears throat> Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah was the education for the town that gastroline was coming and was the education for the town about the mineral mining statute. Because what Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah did about two and, a half, two and a half years ago, they made appointments with every single town board that they could get an appointment with in upstate New York. They crisscrossed the state. And they went and they grabbed somebody from Endicott across the river um, from Delta Engineering. And they came in, anybody, it didn't matter if it was a, if it was a city or if it was a 600 uh, person uh, village. They went anywhere they could get. Um, and they went in and they introduced themselves. And they said, gas drilling's coming. It's really terrible. Here's pictures from Pennsylvania. Um, you can't do anything about it because you're preempted. Here's that gas mining statute. The only thing you can do is road, is a road use agreements. They thank you for your time, and then they started to walk away. And then just before they got to the door, they said, oh, by the way, we forgot to tell you, we've got road use agreements to sell. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong, road use agreements are something that every town and every county should, should uh, think about as, as well as road use agreements. But this is significant because Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah, <clears throat> which went across, if they didn't come to Vestal, it's an aberration. They, I'm telling you, they crisscrossed the, the state, upstate New York. Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah also agrees with what I told you. This is a slide from 624 to presentate, June 24, a presentation that they did. Uh, for the Association of Towns. The red box, and again, I'm sorry to speak so quickly, but this, I want to get through this. Of course, we'll construe it the same way as construed the mining law, will uphold municipal home rule power. <clears throat> this slide is six months old, but I did a presentation such as I'm doing right now, about now two and a half weeks ago outside of Albany, with a white man, Austin, and Hannah Boyer. And as, free, and as recently as that, two and a half weeks ago, I can tell you this, this remains Whiteman's position. So they agree. Bon Schenick and King, largest in upstate, Whiteman Osterman, who have, if they haven't come here, they've come everywhere else upstate. Association of Towns. <clears throat> um, Association of Towns has not itself taken a position on this. Their lawyer, however, um, I've now done six present, five presentations like this since August with one of their lawyers. Um, he says it's past time uh, to stop talking about whether or not the, the localities are preempted. It's beyond time. What he says, his name's Mike Keneally, it's time just to, if you want to, he's not saying you should or shouldn't, but if you think you want to pass protective laws, it's time to do it. All right, I'm going to pick this up. <clears throat> this is available if anyone wants it. Let me know, I'll give it to you. Okay? <clears throat> I want to talk briefly. If we, one of the things that, basically where we end up on this, for reasons that I'll tell you, is that if our recommendation is that a town, even if a town is divided, even if a board, some board members are undecided for reasons I'm going to go into, Again, I'm sorry to speak so fast. 
um, we think that it's uh, the prudent thing to do is to at least pass a moratorium so that the town has options. We're going to talk about that. Whether we do an not, and then after that, if you decide to do something, then it would be an amendment to your zoning ordinance. If we do that for you, which we'd be happy to, and again, we're pro bono, I wanted to show you one example of our drafting. This is our definition of natural gas petroleum extraction waste. Any of the following, whether or not such items have been accepted or exempted from the coverage of any federal or state environmental protection laws, or have been accepted from statutory or regulatory definitions of industrial waste, hazardous materials, hazardous substances, toxic substances, and so on. That's a very unusual provision. This is my 31st year. I've never seen anything like that. I drafted it. So what the lawyers in the room will say, because I'm sure it's unusual to them, is why are you doing that? Let me tell you. The principal primary federal uh, environmental protection laws in this country and some of the most important state ones follow basically the same format. They start by articulating, they give you a list, let's say they're 26 because I know how many letters there are in the alphabet. They go A through Z and they say, uh, they, they, they list the bad things depending on the law, xylene, tiling, benzene, whatever it is. They say the foregoing are all uh, collectively and respectively uh, here and to uh, here and after referred to as, and then depending on the law, they'll say hazardous substances, hazardous materials, and so on. Then they skip a sentence that I'll come back to. Then they go to the second part of the law. And that second part of the law says, okay, anybody who touches, releases, handles, et cetera, et cetera, hazardous materials, hazardous substances, whatever the law is, is subject to the following provisions. And then between the provisions of the law and the provisions of the regulations that go, there are now five or six hundred pages that tell you what you're going, what's going to happen if you're one of these people who touches or releases or handles one of these things. The piece I skipped says, <clears throat> so we've got the definition, xylene, benzene, toluene, before we get to the part about what happens. The piece I skipped says, notwithstanding any provision hereof to the contrary, in the event that the people handling any of the foregoing com compounds, chemicals, etc., are engaged or employed in the oil and gas industry, then and in such event, such compounds, chemicals, and substances shall not be considered to be hazardous materials, hazardous substances, and so on. I couldn't make that up. <clears throat> so, when you're doing a law the people up this room, at the front of this room, if you simply say, thou shall not use hazardous materials in my town, or if somebody's drafting a lease for you in a landowner's coalition, and you simply say you're going to indemnify me for any use of hazardous materials, etc., etc., you've got a big problem on your hands. Because when you say, okay, when you try to enforce that, that somebody spilled whatever it is, benzene or tiling or whatever it is, they're going to look at you and say, it ain't hazardous. <laughs> and would you win later? Maybe. You certainly don't win at the trial court, and you certainly don't win at the lower appeals court. Maybe you win all the way up. So it's really important with these laws that you, uh, you work with somebody who's done a bunch of these. Okay, I told you before, our more, we recommend a moratorium. I'm not going to even tell you what a moratorium is because I want to get to some other things here. Um, but it's basically where you freeze development in the town to give the town an opportunity to see whether or not, um, to evaluate whether uh, something, well, in this case, gas drilling, uh, is, could be a problem in the town, and then if so, what you want to do about it. Do you want to pass laws? Do you not want to pass laws? So, uh, there's no bright line test. It's got to be reasonable given what you're trying to do. We can talk about that later. Um, if I, okay, let's talk about can't our town be challenged. Um, we talked before. <clears throat> people will tell you that it's un-American. Uh, it, it's not the right thing to do to tell people what to do with their property. That's just a, what I think is a good faith, honest mistake, but it's absolutely incorrect. Um, it has always been from before this country was formed, from before the country was formed, it has always been the case that private ownership of private property meant that you, uh, you were restricted in what you did with, with your private property in a manner that you could not harm your neighbor. That's been the law since, in this country since before the country was formed. In fact, that's been the, the law in England since 1066, except for the king who has an exception. And if you're not aware of why I would mention England, it's because we, our law mostly comes from England. So it's just wrong to say that that's un-American or not right to tell people what to do. Property rights are always subject to limitations. Uh, this case, again, Court of Appeals, highest court, person's ability to pursue what's otherwise lawful may in fact be curtailed if infringement is reasonably necessary for the common welfare. All right, highest and best use. They're going to tell you if you pass a law like this, you know, uh, let's say I've got a, I'm, I'm a farmer to, 
and I want to be able to, um, I want to drill. And you're going to put a moratorium. Well, that's, I still can farm. I can still do everything else. It just means that during the period of this moratorium and any subsequent law, I can't drill or whatever the moratorium is. Somebody's going to tell you you're depriving them of the highest and best use of their property. Well, Court of Appeals, highest court in the states, looked at that 100 years ago, almost 100 years. That's not an effective argument. That's always the case when you pass these laws. The law in this state, and has always been law in most of the country, the general welfare of the public is superior in importance to the financial profits of the individual. Okay. Now, this is the second most, this is the second most, and I didn't start precisely at seven. Um, six. 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 The, this is the second most, this is tied to the most important slide here. Thank you. Um, in, um, this is a, I told you that there was a Whiteman Osterman lawyer with me a couple weeks ago outside of Albany. I spoke first. He was behind me. Um, I read this, and I'm going to read out loud to you. He interrupted my presentation to whistle. I can't whistle, but it was like, woo! And then he said, that's powerful stuff. This case that I'm going to read to you is why virtually every single person, every single neutral lawyer, believes that the two cases I'm going to talk to you about, Dryden and Middlefield, uh, the towns will win those. Okay? Highest court, relatively recent, unanimous. A town is not obliged to permit the exploitation of any and all natural resources within the town as a permitted land use if limiting that use is a reasonable exercise of its police powers to prevent damage to the rights of others and to promote the interests of the community as a whole. In the words of my brother, White Osterman, very powerful stuff. I'm going to keep going here. <clears throat> this is not, this case is not Court of Appeals. This is the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the challenge here, your, your threshold to survive, if somebody does challenge you, is extremely low. The, it's the lowest threshold, the lowest uh, standard the law recognizes. It's called arbitrary and capricious. As long as you're not arbitrary and capricious, in other words, as long as you have a halfway decent, a rational reason for doing what you're doing, you will not be overturned. Okay? So... As long as you've got a substantial relationship to health, safety, and welfare, which is what police power is, that's the U.S. Supreme Court. Takings. <clears throat> Very complicated area. I'm going to come back to those in a minute. But as the Supreme Court has said in Penn Central, the notion that a property owner may establish a taking simply by showing that they've been denied the ability to exploit a property interest they therefore believe they had uh, uh, available for development is untenable going too fast. All right. So, there are two lawsuits out there right now. Dryden, which is in Tompkins County, is a lawsuit brought by a gas company, Anschutz. Middlefield, which is Cooperstown, is brought by landowners, uh, one landowner who wants to lease. Both of those cases uh, involve one and only one issue, and that's the issue of whether or not that mineral mining statute I showed you, uh, I'm sorry, the gas drilling statute I showed you, uh, preempts or takes away the town's authority. So those, both of those were filed in the summer. Um, so the question is, all right, we hear you on all that other stuff. Um, we didn't take a lot of time to go through it, but let's assume we did and we believe you. But wouldn't it make sense to at least wait until those suits are over so we can minimize the risk that the time will be similarly, similarly targeted by fracking interests and might have to spend taxpayer funds on legal fees? <clears throat> Experienced lawyers agree. The resolution of those two suits, including exhaustion of appeals, will take, from start to finish, two years. From where we are now, that's another 18 months. Everybody agrees that it's virtually inconceivable that the DEC will have not started to issue drilling permits by then. Okay? So, <clears throat> waiting to pass a moratorium or a protective law until after the permits issue does two things to a town. The first thing it does is deprive the town of a single protection, only protection, the local control that the DEC has built into its draft guys, And that's the right to check that little box that says the proposal to frack in the town is inconsistent with local land use laws. More importantly, we think, waiting is not the financial or fiscally prudent thing to do. We believe that waiting to pass a protective law until after permits issue actually exposes the town, its taxpayers, to hundreds of thousands or even millions, it depends on the town, of potential liability. Liability that does not exist or it would be dramatically lessened if a town passed its protective law before the DEC begins issuing permits. And I'll explain why in a moment. This is because bringing us a, a regulatory taking is a totally different animal than what most people, the kind of taking most people know about, which is eminent domain. 
I skipped that. I'll go back if you give me time. But if this would be a regulatory taking, if it was a taking. In order to do that, the claimant must prove it had a, quote, reasonable investment back expectation. And the calculus involved in proving such a claim changes dramatically depending on whether the law, the alleged re regulatory taking, <coughs> being challenged was enacted before or after the DEC issues permits. In other words, they're not going to be able to make it, uh, successfully make this claim uh, if you pass this kind of law before the permits issue. Mm -hmm. Now that's just taking law. There's a whole bunch of other reasons that they wouldn't win either. For example, you don't own the gas on your house in New York <coughs> State. There's a whole bunch of other the, the things to go to oil and gas law. You have a right to explore it for it, but you don't you don't own it, and that goes to the takings analysis. But so it's important to understand what the Dryden and Middlefield lawsuits are and are not about. Both of those involve only a single issue: whether the town has the legal authority to pass a land use law prohibiting gas drilling. This is the second most important slide, tied for number one in this presentation. Neither one of those suits seeks a penny of financial damages. Neither alleges any so-called takings liabilities. In both cases, before the laws were passed, the people went in and pounded the table and said, don't pass one of these laws. We're not going to drill here. Um, we're not, you know, uh, there's no shale here, or the shale's too thin, or it's too close to the surface, or the gas is overcooked. In any event, we're not going to drill here, so don't pass the law. But by the way, if you do pass the law, we're going to sue you. Um, and we're specifically, we're going to sue you for takings, and we're going to sue you for millions and millions of dollars. In both cases, they went into the town publicly and said that. Okay? Well, the Dryden suit, the other thing to keep in mind is when lawyers, <clears throat> when, when, you, when you have to defend a suit, you have to play the cards that, you, that someone gives you. When you bring suit, you get to pick whatever cards you want. So most people put their best stuff up. <clears throat> the Dryden suit, the one brought by the fracking company, was brought by a so-called super lawyer. If you go to this guy's website, it says he's a super lawyer. Okay? <laughs> now, he played his own cards. He could have picked whatever cards he wanted. His own papers allege that, that his client spent $4.7 million on leases. Yet that super lawyer is not alleging a taking, not for the $5 million or for any other amount. He doesn't seek financial damages under any other theory or claim either. So I can tell you that whether you're a super lawyer or you're a mediocre lawyer, you don't leave $5 million of your client's money on the table if there's anything you can do about it. <coughs> I can also tell you that this wouldn't look like this if the suit was brought against a town that waited to pass this kind of law until after permits had issued. So the suit seeks only to overturn the town's right to pass a land use law that has the effect of prohibiting gas drilling. That means win or lose a town's downside in these cases if somebody does want to bring one, even though they've now brought it on both sides, one from the gas company, one from the landowner. Your only downside is legal fees. <clears throat> what, when I was in my old world as a paid lawyer, we would call college tuition. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the fact is there's some very, very competent lawyers out there and law firms, including some, man some of those big Manhattan firms I mentioned to you, that are willing to defend municipalities in these kind of suits, either, either for free pro bono or for deeply discount, steeply discounted uh, rates. They do that for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, a bunch of them are very upset at the way some of these gas companies have bullied towns, smaller towns. The other reason they do it, some of them, is for marketing. <clears throat> um, you may or may not approve of that, but what I can tell you, even if you do it for, if it's marketing, you don't, in this business, in the lawyer business, you don't agree to do something free in litigation for marketing unless you're pretty darn sure you're going to win. That would be bad marketing. I'll do it for free and I've lost your case. <coughs> Supporters of the industry admit that a part of the reason the lawsuits were filed was to have a chilling effect on the movement to enact bans. They've admitted that. What they don't tell you, however, is that they are at least as concerned about when a ban is enacted as whether a town enacts a ban. So we believe that the real goal of industry's present legal challenge is to forestall the enactment of as many bans and moratorium as possible, at least until sometime after the DC begins issuing permits. <clears throat> so, um, I did pretty well. It's usually a 48-minute thing. Um, <laughs> that's basically it. So our, in, our position is that if a town is if the people in the town are undecided, 
uh, are, are divided. If board members, some board members are undecided, we think the prudent thing to do is to pass at least a moratorium before permits issue. Maybe it's for nine months, maybe it's for a year, whatever you want. You look at it, you figure it out, and then you decide either you go to the next step, which is to uh, pass, in this case it would be a zoning ordinance, or you say we don't need it. What you can't do, by the way, um, and I'm just going to anticipate a question, you can't say, okay, we're going to use that and we're going to come up with um, land use laws. You know, we don't like the fact that it's a, you know, um, a couple hundred foot setback in houses or things like that. We're going to pass our own law in this moratorium and we're going to say and if you're near a school or a house or whatever, it's got to be a thousand foot setback. You cannot, you may not do that. That's operations and processes. Unfortunately, all they've left you in Albany in this, in this particular deal is an all or nothing thing. It's not like other land uses. But again, our, our, uh, so we think that the prudent thing to do is do a moratorium if you're otherwise so disposed. Use that period of time. Um, if you do want to do some protective legislation, it would be a zoning amendment. If you don't, you just pull the plug on the moratorium. If you wait, however, to do that until permits issue, uh, you still can do it legally, but it will, you either, it'll, it'll cost you a fortune. You either have to grandfather anybody who's got permits before then, or you don't have to grandfather and you have to write checks. <coughs> this way, you shouldn't have to write checks. Pretty good for 30 minutes. Huh? Okay.